Okay, so the stock is going to be specifically, I mean, it's heavily demo driven. And at the same time, there's also um, going to push you, you know, to think beyond Python. I mean, I would say that Go is performant and also uh, as simpler as Python, but as Shiva pointed out uh, in the previous talk that yes, the community is not uh, that good, but uh, there are some practical difficulties that I would like to share when like, especially working with large data sets and, uh, and huge projects on how Python had a bigger uh, disadvantage while uh, some things would be able to solve by Go. And this is more of a very flavored talk in terms of what, how, how, how do we use Go for, for computer vision? And, and if there are any people who have already been into venture into Python and, and, and data science and machine learning part, you would say that it's NumPy, there is a huge set of libraries and tools that Python has, does Go also have. So I'm also going to analogously explain how all the Python tools are also available in Go, mainly because also the Python calls the C code internet and uh, internet Python just basically just like a, a application layer, like a very top level, uh, all or what we call as an FFI layer and internet it's all C++ and C. So, uh, so Go is also equally interoperable with uh, C++ and C. So, uh, I mean, it's not hard to port all the Python libraries to go and, and build, you know, per performant applications in Go. So I'm also going to explain, um, you know, how each and every of these tools are being ported to Go and how we can use them. So, so just, I have my code repository um, here. Um, this is like whatever the entire talk, all the code that we are going to discuss in the talk is um, as part of the rep, uh, uh, I have I have just put it into my 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 repo. This is my portfolio website. This is my LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Cool. So like, what is the motivation? So this is going to be the agenda. I'm going to like talk some basics about computer vision and why to look beyond Python and some very basic uh, fundamental things of computer vision. And I'm slowly go, going to go into a little bit mathy part where we're going to talk about some basic matrix uh, uh, operations or mathematical operations in Go. And then we are going to also see some visualization and plotting in Go because Python has a extensive plotting libraries that, uh, that Go um, also can be used that are good plotting libraries in Go as well. And then finally, this is more like a capstone project I took. And then I wrote a phase detection and a redaction server in Go. It's just simply a, a web service wherein it takes a feed from your webcam and then basically detects your face and then it basically blurs it up. Um, so yeah. And then finally, we are going to have a QA. So I'm just go going to cover what you will get out of this talk. So this talk is not something very in-depth. So I'm not going to cover in-depth of Go, um, like how our, uh, Shiva has covered. I'm also not going to explain you each and every line of what code I wrote. Maybe I'm going to explain you some fundamental concepts uh, around when we explain the code. Uh, uh, but this is not about Go. This is not entirely about computer vision. This is a motivation talk wherein you will be able to relate a computer vision application or your future computer vision application to be written on Go. So this is what it's going to be. So coming to the fundamental part. So what is computer vision? A lot, a lot of us have different, uh, you know, notion for what computer vision is, right? Um, so we say, I mean, all we know with, with the current explosion of AI, uh, revolution, we have, we talk about surveillance, we talk about face direction, but where is it, where, like why and where did it start? And what is it exactly? Like how, what, how can you abstractize its, uh, you know, its definition? So basically what is, where it all started is purely from human in, in inspiration, basically modeling of human visual and understanding and synthesis of of the real world um, 
uh, to the machines through algorithms is what is called uh, computer vision is. And uh, so, like through the time, did we actually model the human computer, uh, the, the human cognition? Yeah, to some extent, but uh, is the algorithm, whatever that we have in computer vision, exactly the same way it works in the human brain? Definitely not, because there is a lot of causal factors, especially in, in terms of uh, you know how. Uh, uh, you know how how humans are recognizing things. It's a huge years and like like millions of years of evolutionary advantage that we have. It's hard to crack. But then we try to you know get some nitty gritties on how human cognition works, and then we try to you know put it into algorithms and see you know, whether, whether we can get some intelligence to uh, you know to the machines or, or the vision intelligence to the machines. So basically, uh, I'm also going to explain you how it all started from 1960s um, evolution in the later stages when I'm explaining about computer vision 101. But what I'm trying to point out is uh, understanding observable shapes and patterns and images, or let's say a scene, and understand their visual context, uh, and understanding their contextual relationships is what exactly is com uh, computer vision is about. So if you want to recognize humans are recognizing certain objects because they are able to contextually say, okay, for example, if I'm showing you a, a random image of a spoon, and then I'm going to show you some 10, 12 samples of real world spoons, I'm asking you, I'm going to ask you what this is. You, you're going to precisely say that, you know, this is a spoon because you understand it contextually what a spoon is. It could be probably, uh, you know, some kind of a holder, some kind of, a, you know, a concave shape in the in the front, and there's going to be some understanding that that you subconsciously do uh, to recognize objects. So, can we distill this knowledge to machines? Is what this field is all about. We are slowly getting there, but the field started out as a classical computer vision, wherein we hand engineered these features hand engineered a bunch of things and then we are slowly moving into the world of ai to do all, all these things so so where is this used so there is some of the things that we can say from out of the uh, you know uh, out of the box saying that you know whatever uh, you know in banking and several of these applications we have extensive amount of text extraction and ocr engines being used um, where you know you need computer vision algorithms for recognizing text from images, and you you it's basically used in robotics, which is used in safety industries, um, and then machining and and a bunch of things, and basically all have visual image synthesis and and comprehension, and then the third part. Um, People say that you know computer graphics. People, especially in computer graphics, say that you know computer vision is not a part of it, but it's still a bunch of three D simulation, geometry, uh, reflections, writing shaders, and all of these things are from the understanding of the reflections, uh, you know, light uh, shadow patterns, and all these things, and that they all encapsulate or at least relate inside the, the, the computer vision bracket. And then, of course, we have surveillance, emotion recognition, face detection, and and that entire part of security and all that stuff, which is extensively the computer vision is used. And now, more and more, we are losing on more and more applications, uh, and we are also mining more and more things. But this is like the the, the entire abstraction of where uh, the this computer vision is used. So. So looking beyond Python, so why do we have to, you know, look beyond Python? The first thing is it's really, really slow. So, I mean, uh, it's it's not something that is against it. It's a dynamically typed language. Um, why, why it is slow? We have a bunch of reasons why it is slow. It has a global interpreter lock. It has, um, you know, dynamic parsing and all that stuff, but it is, to look at a nutshell, it's really slow. But why do we still use it? Why did it become really uh, fa famous in the world of you know da data science, machine learning, AI, and ML? Why the community is really strong? It's because pe people can pick it up and start really, really fast. Like it's just like reading 
english right you can read a python code but you can't like sit and read a rust code or a c++ code you need to like sit and grok it but in terms of python you can just you know read it like a book that's how easy it is but then you know when you are dealing with data wherein you are you know going to um, you know go deep inside you know processing millions of data basically you know batching them and then training them and then you know writing some code in pure python or writing some algorithms in pure python uh, also in terms of threading python is really not threaded like if you're using threading it's it's actually not threading at all because of the gil again inside which locks each threads during the execution so it's as though it's sequentially executed so threading is basically useless in python but we can say multi process is 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 is, is decent but then it takes a lot of memory when compared to assume you're using four threads and then you're using you know four processes the amount of memory is going to take for the four processes extremely high especially in terms of memory sh sharing and then process safe queues and stuff like that it's it's really not performant at all at the same time you know python i mean it might be a personal bias but python doesn't really have a distinction between our uh, declaration and usage i mean it's 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 obvious but then why is it a problem because you know uh, this is what i have mentioned here assume that there is a variable that i deliberately declare and then i intend to introduce a new name and that is and this is not a typo but the problem is like if we are trying to I mean you don't need static typing to implement declaration and and usage se separately but then you know declaration and usage is just the same thing in in, in python which is which makes uh, you know really hard to uh, you know really hard to use these things and then it's a runtime language python runtime once it's slow and the other thing is you know you can't really catch your comp there is no compile the concept of compilation here so the biggest thing is only if you run the application you will know the bugs and then the biggest disadvantage of knowing uh, runtime bugs is it might have an, a memory overflow of course it implements an inbuilt garbage collector but still i mean the garbage collector is extremely slow again so there's like a lot of these uh, disadvantages you can solve these to some extent by linting you have pylint and stuff like that but still you know uh, i always i mean i still continue to work on python um, and some parts on rust and sometimes i use go but i still you know despise python but because of the community support and everything i'm still sticking there but i think we can have like a slow change towards go because go is equally e easier to implement and it's still as readable as it's not as readable as python nearly as read readable as python and all these things can be ported to go as well so um i'm going to like start with the basics of computer vision like like it's like dead basics to people like who are not being much exposed to the computer vision and i'm slowly amp up uh, the, the the conceptual constructs here um so what is computer vision we have already established that it's making computers understand images and videos and basically a real world scenes right so yeah so if you see you know in terms of computer vision so if you see this is you are, you are seeing a scene here the scene has bunch of things but you you as a human can comprehend the scene very clearly it 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 looks like a yard in in, in some building which is a scene recognition that you are doing there are cars there are three cars here and there is a there are some flowers here there is a fountain looks like a fountain here and the building is far away the car is nearby you are able to do all these things with just seeing this two d image right because because of your inherent knowledge evolutionary knowledge in understanding images but so what are the problems that we can abstract from here so what kind of scene this is this is a scene recognition uh, problem where are the cars this is an object localization or an object uh, detection problem and then how far is the building so it's basically a, a stereo problem so you have two eyes because it's called a stereoscopic vision wherein you are able to see objects which are nearby which are far away uh, so so and still computer vision you have again stereo cameras which can solve this 
but this is also a, a part of the computer vision problem. So, so uh, as I explained, we have computer graphics. We have so computer vision has allied fields like you have computer graphics, which basically uh, you know models to images from models in the sense the real world models to images. Um, and then you have computer photography, which is basically images to images. You take an image and you have it as an image. And computer vision, you basically you have an image and then you convert it into models. Model in the sense, just a mathematical model of it. And you have math in computer graphics, you have a mathematical. So basically, computer graphics and computer vision looks inverse to each other. So you have a mathematical model of how a light reflects over a shiny surface. And then you render it into an image. It is computer graphics. You basically have an image of, you know, maybe a light reflecting on an object, and then you try to model it and see where the light is reflecting or something like, uh, like that. So this is basically the the relationship between you know computer vision and its nearby fields. So. To be honest, you know, vision is a really, really hard problem to solve, and it's been, you know, still under improvement, or still the extensive research that has been going on. I would say for the past 60, 70 odd years, even uh, maybe. Um, and why is it so natural and easy for us, and why is it not? Because human brains are extremely developed uh, to to recognize objects, and you can see that. The visual cortex in our brains occupies more than 50% of the, of the entire brain, which is like more than 50% of the, the volume of your brain is only dedicated to vision processing. So how cool is that, right? So that's how, that's how, how much capable humans are. And we are trying to bring a similar capability to machines so that we can achieve human level feet uh, and stuff like that. So what is the brief history of computer vision, right? So in 1966, it's where we can, we can evidently backdate it to. So basically, uh, Minsky is like a huge, it's, it's a huge computer scientist. So he assigns, uh, you know, a, a computer vision as an undergrad, he has a computer vision project. And then there are interpretations of synthetic worlds. So, Basically, in the, in the 60s, Guzman is again an, another famous computer scientist. He tried to, you know, model 3D shapes on how, uh, like, how to recognize these uh, 3D shapes, their faces and uh, their faces and stuff. And then on, on 70s, we had, uh, you know, some some strong progress in terms of we we found ways like, um, you know, uh, Otsu method. Edge, um, edge detection methods like tanny edge and stuff. And then we had Sobel mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Where apparent we were trying to detect uh, edges of the images. And that was a huge progress in terms of some kind of an image comprehension here. And then in 1980s, basic, you know, ANNs came along. Like for example, the first one by Joffrey Hinton, wherein, uh, you know, we know that he did basic hand, handwriting recognition using ANN in his very, very, really old um, machine. Um, so, and from then on, you can see slowly this is called an agent phases, where in 1990s, we have face recognition techniques. In 2000, we have Viola Jones, another algorithm that we are going to use now uh, in the demo. I'm going to show you that on how that works. Uh, so, uh, so the hard cascades and then the, the agent phases have been around from 1990s and, and 2000s. And then uh, all, across to uh, 2000s, we had some broader recognition tasks in terms of, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, some video understanding, image understanding. We were starting to build huge and huge data sets. The, the artificial network start, slowly started growing. And across 2010s, uh, 14s, 13s, 14s onwards, we were getting better. The GPUs, you just don't need to rely on the, the sequential uh, instruction set, set, sets in CPUs. We have extensive, uh, you know, parallel instruction processing in GPUs, and we were slowly improving there. So this is like the history of, uh, you know, CD. 
So coming to the next point, uh, just going to explain some basic stuff in terms of you know the OCR. So as I said, this is ba basically the research by Jan Deson, one of the biggest uh, you know names in in computer vision, deep learning, and stuff. That and he built some something called LeanNet again from his name uh, Lee Kun or uh, Lee Sun. You can call it however you want. Uh, so it basically does handwritten recognition. Of handwriting, uh, you know, uh, of handwritten images into real texts using this model called LeanNet. Um, so this is where you know it all started exploding on how much how the the, the, the explosion of possibilities in terms of what all you can do. So the, a similar problem can also be applied for license plate recognition. You have something called ANPR. The ANPR systems are extremely robust nowadays, can handle multiple fonts, multiple scenes. Now you can also detect text and recognize text in natural scenes and stuff. O OCR is a huge field here. And we have face uh, uh, detection. I still remember uh, one of my digital cameras I bought when I was, I mean, my parents bought me when I was in school. It was around, I think, seventh or eighth grade. Where it was doing face detection, and it was my earliest, uh, you know, fascination of how it was able to detect faces. So, you know, we have been having these algorithms since 90s and 2000s, and and it was not surprising. That, I mean, before it was surprising, but now it's not surprising. But you know, you can do all these very easily as part of the ISP, as part of the camera firmware itself. And then you have now uh, more advanced sensors like lidars, you have stereo, wherein you will be able to look at the object from a 3D space, um, now extensively used in autonomous systems and stuff. You can also do something called an SFM called structure from motion, wherein you can have many images and you can combine all these images into a 3D model. So this again, uh, you know, it's slow and evolution of how we are moving into more and more human level and understanding of scenes. So again, again, uh, you know, the most simplest things that we know, uh, object recognition and detection, and one of the earliest companies or startups, I could say, uh, you know, which was, you know, uh, which was in the limelight for a long time that they implemented basically, uh, uh, you know, a, a mounted camera, which was able to automatically check out objects. Like if you put on the conveyor, it automatically recognizes the objects and then it, you, you, you get checked out like the person doesn't or the attender or the employee doesn't have to pick the object and then manually you know read it through a scanner and then and it was the product was called Lanehawk and I mean it was the earliest thing that I got exposed to in terms of recognition and detection it was an amazing use case uh, for this yeah so we saw all these applications, right? So what lies behind the pillar of the entire computer vision? So we have something called convolutions. Uh, convolution, uh, some of you would have uh, heard in your college math or in your school math, where a convolution is just a very simple operation or a window-based technique where you have a kernel window of some weights or some numbers, which will be, so assume that this layer is basically just an image and then this kernel is basically just let's say a three cross three kernel of, of, according to this and a, a convolution is basically multiplication of this kernel with the image in this in with, the, with, the, with the pixel value in this layer and then if you multiply each and every positional candidates here and then if you add it all and then put it here this is what a, a simple 2d convolution of, of, of operation is if you, if you do the same to the 1d then it's called a 1d Convolution. If you do the same to the 2D, it's called a 2D convolution. That's all. So it's basically as simple as that. Um, so 2D convolutions are, and now we have also 3D convolutions for video recognition and, and, and stuff like that. But then if you see, this is the basis. So you can't find, maybe you can find some algorithms which doesn't use convolution in their base layer, but any algorithm that you see mostly like in terms of blurring uh, image transformations uh, you know it, anything that you see it will all be window based and it will all be 
uh, you know, convolution based at, at the base layer because the convolutions can do a lot of things. And I'm going to precisely show you a demo. Uh, I mean, in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. So basically, uh, so we are going to use this thing called Go CD. It's very simple. You can just go and I mean, being uh, exposed to Go, it's not hard to, uh, you know, uh, you can follow the documentation and just install it. You need an open CD based libraries and basically you need a package config in terms of, you know, basically people who are exposed to C++ and make systems, you know, you know, how to see these things, but just make, make sure you are able to you know see these things so if you are if you are running this basically you will be able to see all the uh, you know open cd libraries that are installed in your system that are there in your system and you just need these base uh, libraries for you know making your go cd work that's all um so just install it uh, go cd by hybrid group maybe i think i can even show you Yeah, this, this is your library here, and you can just go around that and look at it. And it's it's also catering to the latest open CD version. I'm using the latest open CD version for all these demos. Okay. So you have um, so basically we are going to load this image. I'm going to show you. Go on mute. Um, sorry. Go on mute. Oh, okay. Sorry. Random noises from Ram Kumar. Um, can you put him on mute? Um, As opposed to you can. Sure, sure. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, if you see, uh, this is the image that we are going to read. And what is a convolution of operation does, right? Uh, so we want to read it and you want to detect the edges. But before going this, I'll just show you some example of you know what this convolution does um, it's like a interactive demo uh, built by a computer scientist again it's very interesting when you get look at it so assume you know um, you have this face as an image and then like basically each and every pixel pointing to this is basically just each and every value and they are using something called a kernel so this kernel is that window i was talking about and this kernel is going to apply across these three cross three uh, area for the entire image, and the and the resultant is going to be uh, you know different based on the different values here. So this is a sharpened kernel, and if you are going for an outline, the, the kernel is going to change. Now you can see that the image is giving the outline of it, and if you are going to give a right sobel, it's going to show all the right edges. Uh, uh, for this, you can also see the window here, the window moving around here and what the window, the, the, the corresponding value the window produces from the left to right. And then you have lots of things, you have emboss, emboss means it just makes the image you know, come out. Uh, and you have a blur kernel which makes the image looks blur. So all these are basically just different kernels being applied. Um, and these are like some comprehensible kernels that people were able to come up from using methods like fast Fourier transforms and stuff like that. Uh, but what the AI does is, if you're implementing an AI, AI, basically the AI learns these kernels. So there are so blur, emboss, deboss, and then sharpen, and all these things are just, you know, basically comprehensible features. But there are some incomprehensible features that human can't model or humans can't ha hand engineer these kernels for. So those are learned by AI. So, but basically, if you see there's a blur kernel and you have different types of kernels, and this is how basically the you know you can also play around with various kernel values here, right? And you can see how they are influencing and how it's changing. And uh, yeah, so this basically to see convolutions are the basis of image processing algorithms, and these are applied across the image and various values of these, and you don't necessarily need to have a three cross three. Three cross three is just a small window size. You can have five, uh, five, five cross five wherein the, the receptive field will increase and you can also have two cross two and anything would be fine. But then there's just like some kind of a sample value wherein if you change it, you can see how it's you know, changing across the image. 
So we are going to implement something very similar, just you know, uh, just looking at the Go CD or APIs here because the entire talk is around implementing Go for around the division, right? So Go Go CD is just a port of Open CD C++ APIs into Go. And uh, if you like, window is basically a method which basically creates a named window. Like, uh, let me just run this code so that you know I can show you what a window is. So it's running now. So you can see that you know this is I'm doing some mathematical operation on it. Some I'm applying some convolutional kernel on it, and it's showing some result here. So this is a result of the value that I am I'm, I'm putting here. Uh, so basically this part, right, this is basically the window here. And if you see in, in Linux, it will maybe an X11 window. In Windows, it will be managed by the window manager. In Mac, it's a, it's a different one. But if you see, this is basically uh, caters to whatever platform that you use. So this is a window. Um, so yeah, so this is what the window does. This is the title of the window that you saw. And then I am read is the API which basically reads the image from here. It's self understandable. And you have something called uh, a mat. So a Go CD mat or a Go CD ma matrix where the image is not read as bytes, but it's been read as a matrix or read as a you know as a, a, a you know a, as a set of pixels. Like you have assumed that your image resolution is 1024 plus 1080. Is basically 1024 plus 1080 uh, images numbers that are there. And if you have a three channel, then it's going to be 1024 or 1080 cross three. So it's just assume it as a three dimensional matrix or two dimensional matrix. So you are just, uh, you know, I'm just initializing an empty matrix because I need to assign the, the result to it after applying the convolution. So we call these kernels as filters. It's like a common methodology or common. Uh, you know, naming convention, that's all, but whether it's a filter or, or a kernel, uh, both are, you know, because why this is filter? Because this comes from the inspiration from signal from processing domain, because image processing is basically a subset of signal for processing, wherein we do a lot of filtering, like, you know, high pass filter, low pass filter, and all that stuff, like all the window based filters. Um, so basically, that's where this terminology is, is coming from. And if you do a filter 2D, basically it takes in a kernel and it applies a convolution on it. So um, yeah, so what you're doing is there's another method wherein you can create a filter with scalar and I'm creating a channel one. So you have mat type. So what type of mat is this? It's a 32 bit float with channel one is a CD mat. So this is what its, its methods are. And you can see that there are a lot of mats here. There are lots of types of maps. So basically this 32 bit float channel one is basically a combination of uh, 32 bit float plus one channel map. So you there is like a multiple types of matrices that you can handle. So you have a 16 signed and 16 bit unsigned, 8 bit signed, you have 32 bit float, 32 bit signed, you have all combinations of this pretty e e extensive. And what I'm doing is I am all I need is a thing as a single channel image. Why? Because I'm re reading it as a gray scale. Again, there are multiple scales of how you can read. Unchanged is basically whatever the format that the file has to read it. Gray scale is you will only take one channel of it or you will convert it into gray, a uh, gray scale image, and then read it. So the gray scale is just you know only the lighting information that you will read it. So that that's why it's called a gray image. Um, so color, basically, you know, there are three pixels, RGB, and then any depth is, you can have multiple depths, you can have a two channel, you can have a four channel, and any color, and you have lots of these things, right, and, and lots of these uh, formats, but I'm reading it as a single channel image, because that's all I need as a simple grayscale image. And again, since the image is a single channel, I need to apply the kernel also as a, as a single channel. And what is the sizes basically? Sizes, what is the result size of the kernel? So you see in the example, we commonly use a three plus three kernel because you know it's easier to use you know odd odd dimension kernels rather than even that dimension kernels because the entire reason is you have a three, you have a nine, you have a three cross three, right? The center of this filter is going to be the uh, 
going to be the spatial ma mapping in the resultant image. But you have a two cross two, there is no center in, in the kernel. So it's hard to you know comprehend and do some image op operations like padding and stuff. But if you have an odd numbered kernel, it's fairly easier. Um, so that, that that's why I'm applying a, a three cross three as a size and then scalar. So the scalar is basically just a way to, uh, you know, this is just like a jugard that they have to uh, to, to, to populate a, a scalar matrix. But then this new scalar is basically used for assigning a pixel. A, a pixel can have four values. It's called RGBA. A is the alpha channel and RGB, you know, red, green, and blue. Um, so, but since I'm only using a single channel, I need a single channel kernel. I'm giving only three here and all those it won't basically take, but you can also assign it with minus one for readability uh, factor. So I'm basically creating a three cross three kernel with all the values as three. So basically it's as, as, as though, you know, you have all these values as three. So what happens here is, is what it is basically. So, so assume, you know, I'm changing all these values as three, three, three. It, it, it gives some value here. Maybe it's because of the position and stuff. It, it's not giving the right value, but then basically, if you see here, I'm I'm giving this this matrix of three value, and then I'm just applying this kernel on using this API, the filter two D as an API. So this API basically takes in an image as an input or as the source matrix, and the result is basically uh, a destination matrix again with a reference, and then you take the depth of it, the depth even if you take if you give three uh, or one, it doesn't matter if your image is just, you know, a single channel, it will take the depth as one. And then you have a kernel, a kernel, we have, you know, these values. And then the point is based, the anchor is basically an offset. Now, assume you want to start from some random point from the image, you can still do that, but I'm getting minus one, minus one, because I want the entire image to be applied. And border. So you want to have a border default, a border reflect. You have multiple methods. Like we have a reflect. Basically, if you see here, there is uh, if you are converting this nine, you know, this nine numbers into one single number, you are basically, you know, have this 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 outline of black patch, right? This is why because we have, uh, you know, we can't see the values in the extreme layer. So we, we can only see the values from, from, from this point onwards. We can only see the values from this point onwards. We can't see the values from here. So that is, and because all these nine values are going to be replaced by this, and these values are going to be re replaced by a black patch, all the outer layer values. So that is the re re reason we are having, you know, this black patch here. And if you want this black patch to be a reflection of this, and you basically this these pixels will be replicated in the black patch as well, and that's called a border reflect. And you have border tra transparent means it won't have anything, just transparent image. And then you have a bunch of these a APIs here that you can go around in the, doc in, in the documentation and, and look forward to. And if you basically ru run this code, and this is the result that you will get. And if you want to see how that the changes, I will change the scalar value and basically show you, you know, how that changes here. And we are using an, I, we are using the same kernel here across the, across the, the three cross three, it's all 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and 10, 10, 10. Uh, so this is how the result works. And this is the basic convolution you know, uh, operation that we are uh, doing. So this is like the fundamental of this, 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 this convolution. I mean, this is the fundamental of the, the computer vision ops or the computer vision of, of operations. So quickly going into the next uh, one, basically um, we are going to see some very, very basic matrix operations in Go. And um, I will list past it because there's just like some exposure or some proof to show that, you know, whatever that you can do in Python, you can do it here. Because often people say that, you know, the biggest strength in Python is basically, um, you know, about uh, all these matrix op operations, slicing and all that stuff is what makes Python really great. But then, you know, you can do all these in Go as well. So that, that's what I'm going to show. 
So assume you want to show a max of this, you want to like find the max of these three elements, just do this, you will find the max, you can find the norm, you can scale it. So th these are some advanced methods which are not Go built-ins, but you can still use this GoNum. GoNum is an extensive library. I'll show you what all the modules that I basically use in day-to-day -day basis. Go GoNum is basically, you know, directly relatable to NumPy and Python. And plotting is, you know, all the stuff that you do for plotting and stuff like that. So, yeah, so basically this is what you um, you have. You can find the norm of it. Norm is basically, you know, um, uh, square root of the squares of all the all the numbers. Summation of, uh, you know, squ square root of squares of all the all the numbers. This is what your norm is, and we can scale it. Uh, scale, scale it by a value by the norm. Basically, if you divide each and every value by a by a norm by a each and every value by this one by l or one by norm it's basically scaling it and you can do all these because you need all these things in, in python i mean for doing some data science stuff um min max scaling and norm scaling and stuff and if you want to compare like two matrices which are having a very long precision like if you have a float 64 the precision is really huge and then like to which point do you have to compare to to actually see that you can have a tolerance value. Assume you only want to say the tolerance has to be within 0 0.001. And if the if the comparison fails be, uh, beneath this, then it's basically not equal. And if the precision is and, and if, the, if the, the, the comparison, if the precision is beyond this, then you can say it's equal. So you can also set custom tolerance values if you're comparing to uh, matrices. Basically, all these features you have in Python, which are there here. So let me just run it in the meantime and just show you the results as well. You can see uh, whether it's the same or not, and then 0.8 here, and the, and, the, and, and the tolerance is here, and then you can say, you know, let's say how it works out. So this is basically a norm value of it after scaling. So we are only comparing it after scaling. So do, do, do not confuse with this. So yeah, so let me quickly go to again another operations where you have, uh, you know, um, you can ba basically assign a dense matrix. Uh, so if you want to, so now we have seen vector operations, right? It's like a single dimensional vector. So we have to now see uh, matrix operations, like two dimensional matrix operations. So you have a data and you have, you can assign your value like this and assume you have to convert your built-in here like this to basically your to your GONAM mat. Uh, GONAM mat is again, uh, you have a mat a module inside your GONAM, which basically has all these uh, built-ins. And you have your new dense, uh, it's basically just creating a dense matrix. And then uh, basically just uh, allocate this value to this, to this dense matrix. And this is how you initialize a matrix. So let's quickly run it. So if you see if I just you know assign it with nil, it assigns a zero matrix um, with zeros. And if I'm having some value, it's also assigning that value to this the specific rows and columns. So this comes to the end of these matrix op matrix ops, wherein we are going to say, you know, um, you know, some the, the basic ops things, right? So how are we going to assign? different ways of assigning uh, the matrix and then um, how, some basic matrix operations like transpose, how easy is it to do a transpose and then find the trace of a matrix and then multiply a matrix, add matrices, find the transpose is just B dot T is will give you the transpose. So these are, you know, some basic ops that just to prove that, you know, it can all be done the same way how it has been done in Python, you can just these are just a sample code. I'll just uh, run this. Yeah, so all this can be done. You can also find the trace. You can uh, do multiplication, addition, and all these things are possible. So now you may ask that we have something called a GoMat, which is a different type. 
and then we have seen in the demo that there is a go 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 CV as a new matrix type. Um, so we have uh, sorry, yeah, we have uh, you know go go CV which is having a new matrix type. Um, so like how how do we make this? So there's a different type. It's confusing. How do I interrupt between both? So how do I convert your uh, our image in Go CV Mat into you know your your bone on Mat so that you can do all these matrix operations. J just like the same way, you are exposed to this library called PIL. PIL has a different format of image. It's again it's called a pillow image. You need to manually convert it into NumPy image or NumPy matrix to do all these NumPy transformations. The same way, you need the Go Go CV Mat to be converted into your you know, go num mat. So this is a help. This is a method I just wrote, uh, you know, yesterday just to uh, you know find a way to convert your go num mat. You you go go see mat again. I'm reading the same image, and then I'm just converting it into a, a, a CV uh, flow sixty four type matrix, and then I'm getting the data pointer uh, for that. So this is just you know again a, a helper method you have your data pointer <clears throat> uh, your data pointer flow 32 data pointer flow 34 uh, this is like a helper method that you basically uh, you know get um, so once you get the the pointer all you need to just <laughs> do it find the total you know this is basically just the total number of pixels that you have <clears throat> right <clears throat> Sorry. So basically, just to compare that, if you do the length of this array, uh, just it will see if the number of pixels is equal to the rows and columns. Just to verify that, and then you can create a go a go num mat. The go num mat you can create a new dense matrix with this rows, this columns, and just populate this array here, and you can get the matrix. It's that easy. It's as simple as that. Just interrupt with that and do. And this then you can apply all your matrix transformations, transpose, phase, whatever that you want to find, standard deviation, mean, median, mode, everything you can do. Um, I think I got some basic statistics also here. Yeah, uh, I can uh, maybe explain it just after this. So let me just run it real quick. So you see, I'm able to read the image and then you know just convert it into a go uh, go num mat from go cv mat to a go num mat. So interoperability is there. And then you can also, if you come to the go num mat, you have a go go statistics module you, which can again uh, you know all the go num modules can operate on your go num mat. So it's again very pretty extensive. You can find the mean, standard deviation. Assume if you want to find the mean of all the pixel values, just to see you know what color that specific object has, right? And uh, and all these some of these things you need these statistical operations. And if you want to have a weighted mean, if you want to find the median, which is basically called a quantile. And you can also give a custom split. If you want the quantile to be 50-50 or 60-40 or whatever it is. You have all these statistical operations which are there also. So let me just quickly run this as well. Yeah, so you get all these things um, again. So yeah, so this is just to prove that you know you have a bunch of these operations that you can do, um, which is as similar to your um, you know your your Python, and you can just you know start doing it right away. And the next thing comes is plotting. I'm going to have just one more slide again, which is going to be like a capstone project that I did to create a phase reduction service. Um, so this is, I'll, I'll quickly go through the plotting. This again, just to say that, so we have three basic principles in terms of, uh, you know, taking up data science and machine learning and stuff in, in, in the language, right? You have a language called JAX. You have a language called Julia. Now, People are saying they are equally good compared to Python. So why? How do we evaluate whether a language is worth going forward in terms of AI and ML? You have to basically see if they have all the numerical operations, statistical, um, mathematical operations, uh, uh, you know, all the matrix operations and stuff. Whether you have 
decent plotting, uh, you know, plotting libraries uh, in terms of how to generate the plots and visualize the, the data. And third is you your community support. The, the, the community support might be slowly building up, but yeah, once you have all these things, right, you can you can you, you can quickly start doing your machine learning projects on Go and see how that you know works around uh, for you. So plotting in Go again, you know, I'm just going to show some really really basic you know plotting stuff. So you're going to be able to have uh, you know a bar chart plot and basically a histogram and the, and the box plot. And again, you have all these modules in Gonam. In Gonam, you have plot, uh, plot inside. Uh, you have percentage utility of plot again. But then you can use both matrix. You have you can use all these ma matrix things. You can use a scalar. You can also use the plotter. Plotter values is again, you know, assigning values to it, um, a, like a, a way of instantiating your values, right? So yeah, so we can do all this, but let me just quickly run um, the go basic plotting stuff. It's going to be a, a bar chart. Yeah. So if you see the plots would have got generated here, this is like a horizontal bar chart and a vertical bar chart. The, looks a little bit rusty, but still there is like a lot of APIs that I have not personally explored. Um, you know, they basically I'll just walk through on what is there. You can basically create a values in terms of plotter values. The plotter is again another data utility or data type inside the bonum. You can assign a matrix and you can have the vertical labels as, as a list of strings, the horizontal labels as a list of strings again. And then you can just like the, the plotter object also has, uh, uh, you know, a bar chart instantiator uh, where you can give the gap between the uh, between each plot or each a uh, bar and then you can give the values and then you can have, you can compute the nominal, you can, um, you know, do all these, uh, you know, basic utilities that are there already available and uh, uh, nominal across X is because for the vertical chart and nominal across Y is, is for the, um, you know, horizontal chart. And uh, yeah, so basically P2 is basically your plot. So what you will do is you will create a plotter. The plotter object is basically just a, a computational, uh, uh, you know, a ca ca candidate which generates the plot and you need to add it to the plot. Just the same way how a Python matplotlib works, wherein you will create an access plot or an X plot, and you you generate a plot and you put the plot into that object. So that that's exactly how you do it here as well. Uh, just to show that you know it's not very different from Python. And then you have again you know various values. I think I already have the histogram plot generated. Um, this looks pretty nice to me if you ask me. Same way how it looks in Python. Uh, this is basically just a histogram plot where I'm generating some thousand values in random. And then I'm, uh, and if you have a random, it's a random normal, uh, basically it just follows a Gaussian distribution and I'm trying to plot it. So I'll just try to also give you a box plot just to show the distributional um, stuff around it, just to see. Um, the box plot will give you an idea or call a box disky plot, which gives you an idea of the distribution. Um, I think the panic. Okay, let me just look into it. I think um, might have missed something, but since the time is running out, um, let me just, you know, I have not tested it, just wrote, dumped it at the last moment and just gave it. But yeah, this just, just to prove that, you know, you have all these uh, methods running out there and, 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 and stuff like that. So let me also, I think the plot is not defined. That's the reason. Yeah. 
Okay, fine. Uh, let me, you know, look into it and maybe update it in my repository. Just fix it and update it in my repository. But in the meantime, I'll just go to the next part, which needs some explanation to do. So this module is just to prove that you can still do as much, uh, you know, plotting and visualization utilities as in Python. So, so the final thing is going to be a capstone project that I did just for this talk. Um, I just, you know, looked into it. I mean, I just like started uh, just by writing a simple uh, Go server, which basically it detects a face and blurs it. And it basically serves in your, in, in your web page. It's all as simple as that. Um, so, yeah. So um, I think I'm not, I, I, I need not explain some stuff here, but I'll just like, Tell you what I'm doing. I'm I'm instance having a reference for the Go CD video capture. The Go CD video. I think before that I did not show you the hello world of com computer vision. This is just like a ceremony that if someone is starting with computer vision, we show that what is the hello world of computer vision is. Just read the image and then and then just uh, display it. It's called a hello world of computer vision. So let me run it in the meantime as well. Yeah, so this is the Hello World baboon that that officially closes the ceremony that you guys have been introduced to computer vision if you have already not. So now let me quickly go into the face uh, detection and reduction server. So basically, if you see, you have, uh, you know, uh, you know, you have a, 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 a video capture object, which basically goes into your dev video zero. Uh, you know, it, it basically talks to your kernel and then goes to your peripheral and then asks for, hey, that is, this webcam is there, uh, can I, I access this? And I think in the meantime, I won't be able to have this webcam. Let me stop my video, um, right? So because it's just to, um, you know, ju just to make the application work, because if I'm, if both Zoom and uh, the application tries to run, it won't work. So let me just try to stop it and I'll instantaneously show this. I'll just first run the code and then go through the code. Oh, okay, I think it's not able to detect because of the uh, because of the. I mean, it's trying to access. I mean, the the zoom is is has got hold of the video, and even if I'm stopping, it's not able to. Uh, let me try out a different strategy. Okay, I think I won't be able to show this demo, but although you guys can, uh, you know, I'll, I'll explain the code, you guys can always go into it and look at it because, you know, the go, the Zoom has caught hold of the, of the resource of your dev video zero resource, which is your webcam and it won't re re release until I, I close the Zoom and I should have like not given it access in the first place. And, I don't think I'll be able to, you know, show that, show this demo. Um, but you, you, you guys can always go to my repository and run this code. It'll work like a charm. That I'm pretty sure. Um, but okay, let me go back to it. So I'll just explain you what I did here. So basically, you have a video capture which will go to your, you know, dev zero, and then it will try to get this resource the, the device is zero, which is basically your video zero, your, your webcam, the only webcam I have it, I have in my laptop. And then um, if you, if you connect an external webcam, uh, it's going to be shown as one as an index one or slash dev slash video one. Um, but still I have only single webcam, the zoom is catching hold of that resource and it's not saying that the index is out of range. It's not able to get any resource and it calls for it. So this layer is handled by something called 
uh, V4L, which is also ported to Mac or FreeBSD, um, which basically goes to your kernel and asks for the resource. So yeah, so basically this is just a simple uh, server and I have given a flag here just to ask whether I have to blur the face or not. Again, we are going, I'm going to explain a little bit of that, that blurring kernel here. And then this just, you know, once it gets the resource, I'm going to basically spawn the detect faces uh, coroutine. Uh, the, 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 the coroutine is going to be spawned here at this point. And then I'm also going to listen to, you know, the, I'm, I'm going to have a pattern here, which is like slash video after, uh, you know, just uh, uh, like, like an API baron, it, it basically, you know, just uh, prints the frame ID, which is crossing which I'm, I'm iterating here. And then these are global variables. So I'm using the mutex here to lock the frame because, um, you know, to lock uh, these, these things, because, you know, if I'm, if I'm not locking the global variable, there's a coroutine, which will try to put the values inside the frame data inside, and this will try to read from it. So it will be a mess. So I have to lock and unlock here whenever this, this thing is happening, whenever this content type, I'm trying to change it. Uh, I'm trying, trying to read the frame and then convert it into a string. Um, so I need to do this. So I am having a mutex here. And then a frame is just a byte array. And then a face blur is just like a flag. You it basically you just have to give it like this. Uh, yeah, I think it's on it. Close. Okay. I think let me you know stop my video. I think it's not because of the zoom, but because of the of the flag that I didn't give. Okay. So, yeah, cool. So you can see that you can see my video here, and uh, um, I am trying to do a face re a redaction here. You can see my face is blurred. Um, um, so it is able to de uh, detect the face and also blur my face. And this are uh, this basically is useful for a various use cases. Like if you are doing, you know, basically, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, data collection stuff and bunch of stuff which require privacy concerns and privacy protection rights, you can basically do this redaction, which is a famous uh, computer vision problem that you can basically do. And at the same time, assume if I don't want it to be uh, redacted, but only need to be localized, I just have to Run this. I'm doing it here, but I'm catching the panel, and, and that's why it's, it's not working in the first place. So, yeah. So if you look at here, doing face detection, there are some false directions here as well. But uh, you see, my face is getting de uh, detected, and it's it's showing a, a rectangular box around it. So it's just like a simple, you know, web service which um, basically, you know, does this. Wherein your index.html is basically just a video container which will have, uh, which will take the source from this video, and then um, just you know, simple uh, thing. I I thought of doing multiple things, right? Like you know, implementing kernel C here with some more utilities, but did because of time uh, constraints, I'm not able to implement them. But uh, this is just like the basic stuff that I could, I could implement and show you guys. So if you see it here, so once I have this go routine called, um, these are global objects where in the frame, it will automatically read it. So let me go to this uh, go routine and, and tell you what it does. Basically, it instantiates a new image, we have a webcam object, which is instantiated again, which is again a global object. Um, so the webcam basically reads it. Um, and then the frame ID gets iterated one by one and it's inside an infinite loop. Um, and you can see that a blue rectangle is basically an, a, a, a color. Basically, if you have 0, 0, 2, 3, 5, it means you just have a blue, um, you know, rectangle uh, around it. And I'm doing something called a cascade classifier. So what, what is it? 
for you there is this algorithm called viola jones or har cascades let me like quickly show what this har ca uh, cascade is right so so har ca uh, ca cascade is basically a set of hand engineered features by computer scientists uh, called paul viola and jones or they are called as viola jones Wherein they were able to say that certain features like this, like a nose bridge, which will be bright and dark at the either sides, and you have these things which will be dark and light at this side, and all this is going to, you know, basically detect. And if you have a bunch of these features, it's going to do something called a boost or an XT boost or a boost algorithm on top of it, going to take all the values, ensemble it, and then say that this is going to be a face. so this is what is being used in facial uh, direction algorithms for a long time in camera isps and stuff but this is like the basic so these are called har features and each or each and each and every one of these bridges these multiple types of features which represents various types of your various parts of your faces it's called a har feature so this is how the har feature looks like i took this uh, base file from the go cv library itself and it's the same across and you have a huge array of numbers and these all rep represents nodes and leaf values all these are interconnected and bunch of values are here it's hard to comprehend but you have this is all hand engineered and you can also generate these har features there are apis for that but i'm using this ready made frontal face har feature to basically load in the, in the class classifier object i can load it and the classifier object has a detection multi scale a multi scale is because a face can be small a face can be huge so there will be something called a pyramidal st strategy wherein the image will be scaled into multiple sizes and and will be uh, detected on each one of this and this also again a window based uh, method so basically this har ca cascade this is a type of a window kernel which applies across the image and this will be you know working across so you will basically get various rectangles so in the demo if you see um you are getting multiple rectangles right so these are this 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 classifier will just give you simply the rectangles and if you see these are multiple rectangles that you can see this one rectangle there is a false uh, detection here and these re rectangles it will just give you and you can basically iterate to the rectangles and then and i'm having this flag i'm having this flag here which i'm giving at the at the start of it so basically if you see the flag i'm just parsing it whether it's again a global object um uh, global variable and the face blur if you are giving it as true what it will do, do is it will just take a region which is the the rectangular region and will apply a gaussian blur to it and it will blur that part if you are not giving the face blur it will draw a a, a rectangle on top of it and then whatever it does i am resizing it to 50% of the previous value the original will be uh, i think 1080 plus 1024 and I'm, I'm, i'm resizing it to half, half the shape and then i am basically putting it onto the frame which is a global value and here i am locking the mutex and then reading con converting the image into the image string because i need to pull it onto the source in our web page uh, and then again i am unlocking it for this this go routine to put the va value into the frame and then the and, and i'm writing it into the uh, response writer object that's all and the response writer if you give it as a source here as simple as that you just re uh, render it here because in html5 you have an image tag which basically just need to specify the source and it will render so this is the entire uh, application and uh, thing and it proves that you can create performant servers performant applications you can do everything that you can do in python and i believe uh, this could be a huge mo motivation for you for your next project to work on cvm go so any questions um, i'll take i think it overshot but uh, um can you guys hear me yes we yeah, can hear you uh cool okay so there are any questions i'll take it i think there was like a chat 
message someone mentioning yeah i think harsha has mentioned that open cv is not matured enough in golang um yeah that's true open cv is not matured enough in golang and of course but if you see this this go cv library also implements uh, cuda um you have all the cuda utilities all the all the kernels that are implemented so basically cuda is a gpu li a library um which is used to you know enhance your uh, application speed by by making use of gpus where all these image operations and matrix operations work on cuda and uh, c++ implements cuda and so is go implements cuda as well i think that answers your question uh, harsha if you are okay all, yeah thanks a lot shrinivas like uh... like uh, thanks a lot for this like awesome pre presentation it was like a real and eye opener uh, i have like one more question to ask you am i audible ah yes yes yeah okay uh, is uh, go cv like prod ready now go cv um yes you can see if you see there is like 4000 stars um and then um uh, you can call it as prod ready because you know it implements all the algorithms i don't know what production applications are using go cv to go cv to be honest but um, i think you can use it because you know writing servers for in, using a python or a flask or a django server i think using go go server you can as much do all these things as you are already doing it on your python and i think it's it it, it, it is prod ready because there is like i mean no uh, immature you know library is going to have 4000 stars and over around 600 forts so i think you can you can use it and i think they are also actively fixing the bugs and they are constantly releasing it and basically this is for the la latest open cv as well open cv 4 and above so i think they are constantly working on it and and all the cuda utilities they have also implemented a separate module called cuda where you can use uh, go cvs uh cuda utilities uh, for all the matrix operations you have like segmentation filters and everything so i think you can use it in your next production application okay uh, the reason primarily well, why i am asking it is oh yeah please go on sorry okay uh, so uh, i'm sure one question as a follow up to harshal's um is toyota connected using um go for machine learning in production okay Or so are they plans yes so not exactly from the cv standpoint but toyota connected uses extensive amounts of go in production we host our um uh, you know we have our clients or uh, our all our grpc clients which reads from the models in go and we have our, our go servers which basically hosts all the types of models uh, in terms of nlp for a product we do have production go for machine learning and ai uh, in terms of computer vision um, i'm planning to build something I'm, i'm i'm working on something on that to you know to make it to, to make something productionized in terms of uh, you know from the cv standpoint okay so i actually like uh, want to tell him something like in the early 2019 like uh, in in the company i work for we use go for back end okay and there is a requirement for us to use a open cv so uh, yeah for face recognition we use a hask cascade and for like detecting whether the user uploaded a valid aadhar card or aadhar card or not like we are like using a custom model for training the model we are using python and for using it on prod like we have implemented a api using c++ because we tried using golang but uh, it was very buggy it didn't work all the time so okay. uh, i want to know if if it is like ready now i can convince my company like uh, instead of c++ we can go ahead and move with a uh, golang that's why i think you can definitely use golang now at this stage because i am able to see because i have also been using i have also been writing code in go since past one one and a half years i think so um okay. but i have always been using cv uh, for for c i have always been using python and python in terms of tensorflow and and, and pytorch yeah. from from python yeah and then uh, in terms of c in, in terms of serving we use tf serving which is uh, the tensorflow's extended utilities when we serve the model using the tf server binaries but now i'm 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 able to see that you can for example go 
CV has a me method to also, you know, uh, you know, load TF models, TensorFlow models, and GoCV also has method to, to load cafe models, and uh, you can inference on it as well. And I'm not sure uh, as like in what part of it was buggy, like was it buggy in terms of oh, uh, like uh, the, the recommendation part, for example, like uh, when like a uh, API request is like happening in Go, like uh, it's not like predicting like correctly, whether it is like a uh, a photo or not like it's not loading the model correctly like the trained model whereas okay. it was like uh, working properly in c++ okay uh i'm not sure about that but i have used go in a couple of uh two to three hobby projects um so i think i mean the basic model loading and inferencing those things are mostly fixed um is what i is, is, is what i think and uh, um i think you you should you you would be able to work uh, you know something on it on the on the production level right now at, at 2021 you will be able to do it i guess okay okay thanks a lot sir yeah. for this like awesome like meetup and uh, thanks a lot sir uh, gaurav sir to uh, i have some other work so i will catch you guys in the next meetup sorry to leave you half hour thanks sir for your patience um see you next meetup um there's one more question from ranga i think um on the chat so when there is julia specifically for ml how does go stack up against it she um, you need to go yeah i am not very uh, i i have not used julia at all but from the community standpoint i can say that julia is also a high level dynamic programming language much like python but the way they d designed their runtime uh is like much better uh, than python is what i have all i have i have i have heard and it also implements in its lower level layers it also implements nlvm and uh, and some other robust stuff as well so uh from the programmatic standpoint i'm not able to comment on it but extensive amount of data science work uh, is being done by julia it is being done in julia as well and how, how does it stack up against go um i'm not very sure go is extremely matured compared to i mean go as a language is very matured compared to julia um i mean julia is go has been there i think for the past what 10 years or, or something um, I, i think so um, maybe more or maybe less i'm not correct me if i'm wrong but julia is like uh, maybe started early but then it's only for the past 3 years i'm looking at community uh you know stuff been going around julia so i'm exactly not sure but in terms of you know in in terms of per performance go must be definitely better because go is a statically typed language um it has a it has a very robust uh, runtime it has as shiva already mentioned it has green threads it has a lot of uh, you know great stuff that makes it really productionizable uh, you know language so i think again sta starting up against julia but specifically for ml i'm not able to co comment because of the community uh, but in terms of productionizing and language maturity go is definitely uh, mature i think that answers that would answer you someone also asked for my report uh, let me make a, a quick push and just share you the report link ranga um once again great talk shini um i think that was really well received uh thanks uh thoro if um there are no further questions um um we can just have a, like a random session like we can just um talk about go for a while or we could drop off and meet meet up at the next uh, meet up i know we are way past the uh... yeah way past the time so but let me just you know share the repository link i have shared it so if you guys wanted you can take that and also maybe i have to share the presentation gaurav should i share it in in our uh, in your i mean in the meetup page or like how does it work yes meetup page would be the best um so you can share the presentation link as well as the repo as well um okay. on the meetup page okay cool got it cool yeah okay. i think um fine i think we have like four members and uh, you guys had lunch i mean do you have lunch garo 
No, no, not yet. Um, I yeah. have lunch, bro. Cool, cool. Okay. I'll be heading out. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Anyways, thank, thank you. Thanks, Shini. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you. Sorry. Bye.